my name is Doug Lister. I'm the CEO of uh, Frontcore. Frontcore is a company developing training management software for training providers. Um, we have, over the past few weeks, had many conversations with training providers who wonder what's going to happen in the industry now with the, with the COVID-19 pandemic. So we decided to do a video series, um, three videos where we discuss uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the market. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the benefits of online learning. And we'll also do a third video um, talking about the practical steps you have to take to convert your classroom-based uh, training to an online format. I'm really glad to welcome Espen Andersen with me here today. Hi, Espen. Hi. How are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm really good, too. Glad to have you. Espen... Um, Espen is uh, an associate professor of strategy at BI, Norwegian Business School. He leads the Center of Digitalization and is also an adjunct professor of uh, the Department of Computer Science at the University of Oslo. And um, Espen holds uh, a doctorate of business administration from the Harvard Business School and has also researched and consulted and spoken on technology on, and strategy issues for, for a number of large organizations in, in, uh, in many countries around the world, including the US, Europe, and Australia. And he is also on the board of a couple of tech companies. And um, today we're gonna to talk about the benefits of online training, Espen. And before we begin, I, I just wanted to start by saying that I'm, I'm, I'm really certain based on conversations I've had with a number of training providers that many are now overwhelmed and a little frightened mm -hmm. of how the COVID-19 pandemic will affect them both short term and long term. And in, in the discussion today, we're going to be talking about the benefits of, of moving to an online format. And um, let's, let's start by seeing if we can motivate a little bit by by talking about the exciting trends around e-learning and as you know as the e-learning market is is huge and it's according to elearningindustry.com it's going to be growing to 325 billion dollar in 2025 and mind you this is pre-covid 19 numbers mm -hmm. Uh, the, the equivalent number was 165 US dollars, a billion US dollars in 2014. Some, now, some numbers from the US, which is really interesting. In 2017, approximately 77% of US corporations used online learning. However, 98% planned to incorporate it in their program by 2020. Mm -hmm. That goes to tell us a little bit about the development. And if, and if we mentioned then that back in 1995, that number was 4%, we see a trend here in increased adoption of, of the e-learning format as a, as a training tool. And also, let's just end that by saying that e-learning for companies grew by a stunning 900% between 2001 and 2017. So there's obviously a trend where e-learning is being adopted more and more. As well. what, what would you say is the main benefits for training providers in, in using you know, the online format in their uh, offerings? Well, um, there are lots of benefits, uh, but you know, you, some of those benefits are also threats depending on how you respond to them. Right. Um, one obvious benefit is that once you have developed an electronic course, you can offer it anywhere in the world. And you can have, there is very little cost associated with having more students, depending on how much interaction you have. That's a fantastic benefit. It is, of course, available to all training providers, which means that you are now not competing against, you know, the local heroes in the town or the city or the country you are. 
you're competing against the whole world. Right. So, um, and we, we very often see when things go electronic that there are shifts in market shares. Um, so, so, so that's, that's one side of it. And, you know, I think, I think the only option is to think of it as a benefit, you know, wow, we can reach new markets. We can do something really good. That that's a, at least the mindset you need to have. Uh, if, if not, you might as well pack up and think about something else. Right, right. So that's a huge benefit. Exactly. The second one is that the cost model shifts because you will have a much higher upfront cost in creating the content. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a cost both in time uh, and in resources. You obviously need to make an investment in technology. You need to locate faculty or, or teachers who can come across when they're talking into um, um, a, a, a camera, um, who can who can you know make things interesting. And you need to reshape the message. You need to spend a lot of time editing. I'm I'm now converting my courses to online, not just yeah. sort of the first step where you do a regular course and just talk into a camera but I'm making videos, I'm making shorter snippets, I'm rethinking the whole structure of what I do. And I find that it is lots of fun to do it. I can have fun editing and, and, and fixing things, but it is an enormous time sink. So the commitment in the creation phase is much, much higher. Awesome. One of the best schools I know about when it comes to um, uh, online interactive teaching is IE Business School in Madrid. Uh, they do online teaching and they pay their faculty that do online teaching twice as much per course as they pay the people that are um, doing it in the classroom Interesting. simply because it's so much work. Right. But of course the benefit is that, you know, I don't know, beyond a certain number, you can't have interaction with the students. Maybe that number is 300, 400, 500 above that. It gets very hard. Right. Well, at that point I might as well have 50,000 students. Exactly. Um, you know, so the, so the economics change. High front cost for produ production, very cheap distribution cost afterward. Right. So if we talk about that for a while, because that may that 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 changes the business model a bit. You Absolutely. basically you basically ha have uh, you know higher operating leverage. You, you basically have a lot of the cost up front, but then you have scalability because you can basically distribute that content to a much wider audience. There's no geographic constraints anymore. There's no capacity constraints anymore. And if you do it in English, you basically have a global market if the content is relevant globally also. So income wise, if you are capable of marketing your offerings, you can basically create an enormous leverage in the income side of, of your business. If you manage to capture that crucial, crucial market share, what we normally see when markets go global is that we go from a sort of the middle layer disappears. You get lots of small specialist providers and then you get um, a few that basically capture a big market share right. and people come back to them. It's the Amazon story of groceries or, right. or, or, you know, shopping online. You go to Amazon because they're big and they have everything and you trust them. Right. So, you know, some will capture that. Right. And then for the rest, maybe you need to specialize more. You certainly need to differentiate more. You need to be right. more available at that particular time when people need training. And fortunately, the tools allow you to do that. But you need to think very, very carefully about what the way Clayton Christensen phrases it is, what is the job the customer is hiring me to do? Right. Um, so... You know, why are people signing up for this course? Why are people taking this training? Why are they actually doing it? You sort of think, what, what's the problem I'm solving for the customer? And then solve that problem. You need to refocus on that bit. Can I, can I sum up there that, that if, if you do this really well, you can either excel by being really good at marketing, meaning you have a content and you beat, you know, your competition in the marketing side of the business or you are really good at differentiating yourself and then basically the differentiation is what makes you excel in, in the online yeah. offering 
And like I think we talked about, you know, so much of differentiation is regional and maybe by language that becomes much less of a factor and you need to be, you know, the one source for online training on a very, very narrow topic where you are the absolutely best, or you need to be the source for a wide range of things where you are sort of the go-to. A bit like you go to Wikipedia if you want to learn something at a very shallow level, and then you go more specialized as you become more knowledgeable. Exactly. Now, I think what's, what's interesting here also, because now, now that we're talking online, suddenly we're talking, what are my opportunities globally in this? in the training market. So if you're really clever in picking up trends, you can basically also target niche uh, training offerings as you see new uh, areas of expertise are needed. Like we see a lot of talk about work life skills, a lot about you know AI, blockchain, robotics, and, and areas like this. So if you're clever in business development and converting that knowledge that you have about the different expertise needed into a good training offerings, then you can actually target a global market. Yes, uh, except that, you know, if you take a thing like blockchain, which is kind of a sort of technology that people talk about, you know, I think the market for explaining what blockchain is, is, is gone. What's not available there is thinking about a specific customer set and saying, well, what does blockchain mean for that set of customers yeah. and and then you know explain that in depth with good examples and if you can if you can rope in some of the people involved to sort of share experiences then you're sort of walling off a small part of the market um, where you will have a very dominant role right we also see uh, in the u.s particularly but i think also we see the same trends in in, in europe um, outsourcing, either comprehensive outsourcing, as they call it, or partly outsourcing of training from mm -hmm. corporation is a trend. Now, this means also if you're in a if, if you're now in the online format, you can you can actually do guerrilla marketing towards large corporations and tailor make online offerings to uh, to to corporations around the world. That's also an opportunity. Yeah. Absolutely. What, what I've seen, um, you know, I, I much with a big corporation, many of them have sort of defined career ladders. And in order to reach the next career ladder, you need to um, fulfill certain skills criteria. Yeah. Well, I, I don't think many training providers go to big organizations, ask to see, you know, what is the career steps that are defined that these big organizations are, and then tailor their offering to that. So that you become the in-house provider, for instance. That's one way of utilizing online to be able to deliver specifically for a customer. Right. And if you, if you do that with a tailored offering towards the customer, at the same time as you create the content in very small pieces that can be combined, yeah. you can get productivity and, and quality on both sides. Right, exactly. Now, let, let's talk a little bit from the training provider perspective in terms of the, 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 the flexibility and the productivity that you can have and take advantage of in the online format in terms of you don't, you don't have to have a, a rented classroom anymore. Uh, instructors can sit anywhere. Uh, you, have, you don't have to pay the rent for the, for, for, for the, for the classroom. Any, any perspective on this and, and the benefits of having that flexibility in, in your um, training and, and in your professional organization doing offering training? Well, the, you know, the, that's marvelous in terms of costs, but that flexibility comes with costs as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, if you get students into a room, for instance, um, every uh, October, I do a four-day executive seminar in the south of France at a technology lab together with Accenture. And the core sort of benefit of that program is that we get everybody together in the same area. They have the same experience. We sit in nice places and we talk to each other. The sort of the physicality of the whole thing is the main experience. Yeah. That's expensive to provide, but it has a very high yield. The, you know, when you go online, the costs are almost zero, at least in the distribution phase. But it's very 
much harder to capture sustained attention from the people that are out there, your, your students. And it's also very hard or it's not impossible, but it, it requires a different mindset. It requires different technology, different ways of thinking in order to, to foster interaction between them. When I talk about teaching and how to do a course, I talk about three phases, foundation, flow, and feedback. So foundation is when you, know, you set the contract with the people that are being trained, the students. And you know, what are their expectations? What, you, what are you gonna provide? What's gonna be the end result? What do they need to do? Then you have the flow is, is the actual delivery of the course. And everybody wor worries about that part. But if you've done the foundations right, that sort of goes by itself. And then there is the feedback part. How do you provide feedback? Right. Right. And if you're doing that online, it, the nature of all of those steps changes. There are different skill sets. You need to plan a lot more. The, the, as I mentioned, the costs and the effort shifts to different phases in, in the delivery of the training. Mm -hmm. right, let, let's, let's turn the discussion around and, and talk about the benefits for the delegates or the corporations of mm -hmm. engaging in, in online training. What would you say are the main benefits for, 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 for participants and corporations in, in using online training? Well, they're slightly different. Um, the benefits for the corporations are, you know, in costs and, and, and the sort of sheer variety of what you can make available. Right. And I, I think, you know, if you look at things like degrees and certifications, they are very much tailored or formed based on physical programs. So programs take a year, you know, you build up building blocks, you talk about teaching hours and so on and so forth. There are semesters and so on. Well, all that goes out the window. Um, you still have uh, content that takes time, but you know, for the corporations, you know, they can provide thousands of courses instead of say, have a contract with one or two or three training providers. They can provide, you know, a lot of courses. Um, for, the, for the people that are um, um, taking the courses themselves, the participants, um, you have the freedom to do it whenever you want. So you very often see people take online courses because you know they work, they have children, they can do it at night. Um, maybe uh, they have work where they have downtime where they can do this. Um, maybe they are in physically inaccessible places and so on and so forth. There, there's a great leveling when things go online as they do now with the COVID-19. Everybody is sort of in the same situation. Right, and, I, and, and one, one interesting statistic, because we hear, I don't know why that, that is, is floating around as a, as a nearly a myth that, you know, it's less effective to do online learning, but mm. I'm sitting here with stats saying that e-learning actually increases retention rates by 25 to 60%. Yeah. Because the student controls the learning process and the progress themselves. They can access material as, as often as they want to, to review what, what, what is maybe becoming difficult for them. They can take quizzes over again if they fail. What do you, what, what's your comment on that? Well, you can, you can tailor the teaching to a time when it fits you and also a tempo that fits you. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of universities film the lectures and there are students that prefer to see the filmed lecture because there's no interaction in the classroom anyway. If you have 500 students, it doesn't matter. So at least, you know, you can stop the professor if you don't understand what he or she is saying and then go back a little bit and play it over again and over again. If you have a professor who speaks very slowly and pedagogically, to say everything, that's way too boring. Okay, so you flip it to one and a half or two speed and you can just blow through the whole class in half the time yeah. and still get most of it because we speak much slower than we read. At least most people, you know, the spoken word is slower. How does this then, because one, we can look at this from the side of the training providers and we say that, you know, online learning means there's more competition. Now more competition, is usually good for the delegates because not only does it drive innovation and 
you know, drive the ability, you know, drive the need to be really good at what you do, but it also probably drive the number of offerings they can choose from. Absolutely. Yeah, you can, and that is a competitive threat, but also a benefit because, you know, it, it, it's a more liquid market. So there will be more spaces, you know, specialties, things you find. I think you need to, you need to be really nimble and quick on your feet. In a crisis situation, you make decisions, you test things out, what works, you continue to do that. And I think maybe that's the big, biggest challenge for the training providers right now is that you need to be continually experimenting and building your things. Exactly. Mm. What's happened is that online learning has become a little bit better every year. It's a disruption. It kind of eats in. And it used to be a low market thing for people who either couldn't afford um, physical or the, to do, go to a campus or, you know, or for some reason couldn't do it because they were in a remote location or something like that. But, you know, gradually the, the quality of online goes up and up. We learn to utilize the medium better. The technology gets better. The cameras get better. The sound gets better. You can do more. Everybody has better PCs, better, better, better iPhones. Right. So, you know, uh, gradually it becomes better and better and better. And for some kinds of education, particularly if you're wanting really tailored things that you want right now, Right. You can free yourself from time and place and do it whenever, exactly. you know, in some areas, it will be better than the on-premise um, education. I don't think online is going to replace uh, physical education unless we're going to have this uh, virus thing for the you know, next 10 years. Um, on, on premise is better <laughs> yeah. in many settings. Right. I want to come back to another point. Another benefit I think about online learning is because we all, all, we all observe the increasing pace of change. Change has happened so much quicker. And, and one of the things that obviously goes along with that is you need to continuously upskill your, your, um, your workforce and corporations need to build capabilities all the time. Now, one of the things that online learning offers that it's more difficult with with classroom based or, or on premise training is you know is is the ability to to roll it out fast you know globally you yeah. you can basically get access to new content really quickly and you can roll it out quickly so you upskill your organization quickly and that brings me all to one of the other things that we we, we initially discussed price yeah now on the part of corporations buying training or delegates buying training you see online uh, offerings usually are, are more affordable than classroom-based training. Absolutely. And where they are expensive is, you know, you're not really paying for the content per se, because you can often get that somewhere else. Very often the price is tied to certification. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, you see the really high prices for uh, courses and training that gives you some sort of stamp of approval, right. you know, an official exam or whatever. And uh, for the big organizations and the established universities, most of their competitive advantage is no longer in the training they provide, but in their ability to put together sort of a Lego block set of qualifications that lead to a degree. Right. And uh, we haven't yet seen that structure pop up in the online world, uh, maybe the, this uh, uh, virus situation is the thing that is going to make that happen. Okay. But once certifications and grades make it online, yeah. then a lot more is going to be online. Yeah. I was just reading that IBM switched to e-learning and claims to have saved $200 million on it. Yeah, but there's huge savings in that, and that reflects, I think, the business model of online learning. You can basically you you have the cost of you have a higher fixed cost, but then you have lower variable costs, so you can scale it out, and you can have a you can actually sustain a lower price for that offering. What well, let, let's move you know to learning outcomes because we talked a little bit about this that retention seems to be higher, but. Um, what, what can we say in terms of the benefits of the learning outcomes for delegates 
participating in, 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 in e-learning versus classroom-based uh, learning? Well, I don't have statistics here, but most of what you see online tends to be things that are um, skills based in the sense or, or, you know, knowledge based. Here is how to, you know, do a certain thing in statistics. Here is how to program something on a computer. Here is how to cook. Here is how to do something else. What is much harder to do are things that involve uh, personal development, like leadership skills, I would think is really hard to teach online. Communication skills, you can talk about it, but in order for the students to learn, they need a way to practice in context, and you need to provide that in, in some setting. Mm. So if you're looking at, you know, the, it, it's, it's, it, I think it's easy to say that for online learning, you have things like retention, people remembering things will, will go up because you can provide things in smaller portions and you can make them pedagogically very, very good mm. with graphics and, and pictures and film and, um, and all kinds of things. Yeah. But retention is only one part of it. Yeah. Um, for instance, I like to teach my students critical thinking. I like to give them tasks where they fail and they're intended to fail and then have a discussion why did we fail in this and mm -hmm. that experience is much harder to translate uh to an online setting right. so um and but you know new technologies new ways of doing things always come in and take the easy markets first and then yeah. gradually and transition then to the harder markets so you know i'm sure people will come up with inventive ways of doing it i certainly hope to do so myself yeah let's just talk a little bit about E-learning as the greener option. You know, there's a lot of talk about environmental, you know, friendly solutions today. And, you know, classroom-based training involves transportation, which means you take time away from work. You also have to go somewhere in the process. So um, what's interesting, the Open University in Britain found that online courses equate to an average of 90% less energy and 85% fewer CO2 emissions per student than traditional in-person. Yep. Training. It certainly is the greener option. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting there very often when you are trying to create a business case for an online uh, program or a training program, you, you fail to consider all the costs that go into something. Yeah. I think, to, to end this discussion would be interesting to talk a little bit about opportunities that comes from being, you know, clever with the online format. And we talked a little bit about, you know, um, mobile learning. I just, just want to sum up a little bit here because, uh, you know, there's, up, there's about 600 million people subscribing to mobile learning applications today. Mobile learning is, is coming more and more. And I have some statistics that I wanted to share with with the, with, the, with the listener today, because 80% of people have a smartphone and 90% of millennials have their smartphone on them all the time. Yep. Now, a fifth of them only communicate via smartphones without the desktop. And according to Malik Ducard of YouTube, 70% of all YouTube videos are watched taking, uh, uh, taking place on a mobile device. Yep. And they have 500 million daily views of learning content. Yep. Um, they see the world in, you know, a format which is this big. Right. And uh, the problem with a format that is this big is that you're very limited to what you can send through there uh, and have the same learning experience on the other hand. Um, I'm reminded of, there is a company in Norway called fin.no. Um, it's an online uh, market. They have a very big, it's like eBay for Norway. Um, very high market share, extremely high profitability. And when they discovered that more and more people were doing things on a cell phone, the CEO said, from here on out, everything we do should be developed for the smartphone. And the developers didn't like it because they wanted to work with the bigger screens, much more options that you could do on a PC or an iPad. And said, no, everything should be developed first for the smartphone, and then we might do the bigger screen version of it later. Okay. 
And I, I think when you start, um, you know, thinking about your learning content, you should very much all the time try to make it at the very least, you should look at the smartphone, you know, the smartphone version of what you do and see what it looks like and then say, okay, maybe I should make the font bigger on my slides. Maybe I should make the content smaller so it fits into a bus ride. You know, you need to think through the context of where the students are sitting. Yeah. You know, if we're going to sum up a little bit here, there's obviously a number of, of benefits, both for the training providers and uh, for delegates. And I think if, if there's something that I'd like, you know, our listeners to take out of this is there's so many arguments that you can use in promoting your online, online offerings. Hopefully you get some ideas from, from this discussion today. And I think, you know, to, to end on that note, there are basically five benefits, you know, with, with mobile training and that's access. You can get it anywhere. It's convenience. Whenever they have time, they can put, pull it up. It's retention because you, you have to be really clever in communicating via the mobile phone. You can't go around, roam around. You have to really be crisp. Yep. Uh, acceleration, you get instant access yep. and speed. You know, it's so fast to roll out. So I think that's also something, the mobile first strategy and training will probably come also. And that's also an opportunity for all, all training providers. Espen, I think we should round up there. I thank all the watchers for, for watching this. We're going to be doing also a third video now because we've been talking about the impact on the market. We've been talking about the benefits of online learning. Now we're going to talk about what I think is very exciting, you know, the practical steps of, uh, of moving from classroom-based formats to online format. And I'm really glad Espen, to have you talk about that since you have first-hand experience from doing that yourself. So I really look forward to that. Um, Espen, I thank you so much for your very, very insightful comments today. And I look forward to, to talking uh, soon again. Likewise, thanks for having me. And um, well, I'll see you the next time. See you. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye.